text that we read to be able to just show us a context too, so that we can fully understand what this peace is all about. When we say peace like a river, what does that truly mean? When we look at the text that we read in, in, in Isaiah chapter 9, before you actually go to Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9, they are almost like all together. And so to fully understand chapter 9, you have to go all the way to chapter 7. So in the beginning of chapter 7, the, East, the nation of Israel, because at that time Judah and Israel had separated. Uh, they were not one nation at the time. So the nation of, of Israel and as, as the nation of Israel and Syria were deciding to come together and they wanted to come, they wanted Judah to join them to form a coalition against Assyria because Assyria was a stronger nation. And so these two nations are wanting to come together to form an, a, a coalition with Judah. But Judah is scared because Judah knows that Assyria is strong. So what the king of Judah does is that he decides to send a ransom to the king of Assyria, like, hey, I'm with you, just don't come. But then it's in the middle of that, and then what is funny is that in that, in that um, uh, scenario, we have like two um, uh, children that are in that prophecy in the book of Isaiah from the se chapter 7 to, to chapter 9. We have two children that are significant. One is the son of Isaiah, and his name means, I can't, I'm not going to call his name because it's a little... Difficult, so. <laughs> uh, but his name means a, a remnant shall return. And then the second child is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And from chapter 7, that's the first time that a prophecy comes, that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Oh, no, sorry. That a, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to his child, a child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what is funny is the place where that child was going to be born, Galilee of Judea, was going to be the same place where they are fighting, the same place where there is fear, the same place where there is tensions and crisis. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, not only was Jesus born in, um, in Galilee or Bethlehem of Judea, but most of his ministry happened in that space. In the space where in the time when Isaiah is prophesying, there is war, there is tension, there is strife, there is like just unease. This prophet is coming to give a prophecy to the king like, hey, don't worry. That things are going to change. Things are going to turn around. It might look like this now, but it's not always going to be like that. And as we prepare and walk towards the advent of Jesus, his second coming, we are reminded that's what life is going to look like. Yes, today there might be wars, there might be tensions, there might be strifes, there might be broken relationships, but a day is coming. When the wars shall cease, a day is coming when the strifes shall end. A day is coming when peace will fully be restored. But for now, in this in-between place, we wait. We wait in hope. We wait in anticipation. We wait in expectation. So from verse, um, uh, chapter 9 from verse 7, it tells us that unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Every prince has a kingdom that they are part of. He did not say he's a king of peace. He's a prince of peace because his father is the king. And so Jesus is going to come, or he came as the prince of peace to live in this world and to be able to restore peace to humanity. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, so if Jesus came to restore peace in his, in, to humanity, why is it that in the time of Jesus, there was still chaos, there was still fighting, there was still tension, there was still strife? And we are going to look a little, we are going to go to that a little. Uh, but the first thing is, let's just define what is peace. In our human definition of peace, it's easy like, oh, peace is when there is no tension. Peace is when there is no strife. Peace is when we don't quarrel. Peace is when there are no wars. Peace is when uh, everybody is okay with everything. And anybody feels like that's how the world is trying to make us define peace? Because if I don't agree with you, then it means we are not at peace. No, we can still not agree and still be at peace. You can still have an opinion that is different from mine and we still be at peace. Peace is not mean, does not mean me yielding what I believe to what you believe. Peace means I can hold what I believe in tension with what you believe. And we can still live together in the same space, in the same vicinity, and still walk in God's love. So 
in, in the Hebrew word for peace, there are two. The, 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 the Hebrew word is shalom. I think it's a word that we have heard over and over. And the English word is erene. Both words mean quite similarly the same thing. It's almost like you have a wall, like a house, the wall of a house. And then there are pieces of bricks that are missing from the house that can easily make the wall to fall. So when the Bible says shalom, it means you are putting the pieces back so that this house is being kept together. So when the Bible says we are restoring shalom, it's every piece that is missing comes back to its place so that the house is whole. It is made complete. There is nothing broken. There is nothing missing. So most often in, 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 in a Jewish culture, they are going to say a blessing of shalom to you. They are saying, we want your life to be whole. We want your health to be whole. We want your finances to be whole. We want everything about your life to be whole. Nothing missing, nothing broken. So peace is not just about quietness. Peace is a life that is whole. Peace is a life that has nothing that is missing in it. Peace is a life that is fully complete. But true peace is not something we can work out. If Jesus is a prince of peace, it means we can't experience peace without Jesus. True peace only starts with a relationship with God. Because in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, that relationship was broken and something was missing. And so for, that, for us to come to, into peace with God, that relationship has to be restored. And that's why Jesus came. He came to restore our relationship with God first. We don't work to get peace with God. We believe in Jesus and accept him into our heart to come into peace with Jesus. We can't walk ourselves to this kind of peace. We might have things go once in a while, but the kind of peace that God gives that can allow you to sleep in the middle of the storm like Jesus did is the kind of peace that only comes when we have a relationship with Jesus. And that comes by us allowing the Prince of Peace to come. And another area where God comes to, where Jesus comes to bring peace, it's not only in our relationship with God, but it's in our relationship with each other. It's able to bring broken relationships to be restored, to mend the pieces that are broken. In human relationship, before the, jail, the Jews and the Gentiles were enemies. But now Jesus comes and we can call our Jewish brothers, brothers and sisters. Because God, Jesus came to restore that relationship, making everything whole again. But to me, one of the ones that I really believe that I like the most is that the Prince of Peace comes to restore wholeness with ourselves. Because most often the greatest area of brokenness where things are missing is in our relationship with ourselves. Because when our relationship with ourselves is broken, it impacts every other relationship around us. Where we can start believing in who God says we are and walk in who God says we are because we have experienced the Prince of Peace. That this Prince of Peace also comes to restore wholeness among nations and tribes and tongues. And as I said more previously, is that why would Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, come and we celebrate that he's the Prince of Peace? Why do we still have wars? Why do we still have tensions? Why do we still have chaos? Anybody ever ask that kind of questions? There is something that I like to, that I like to, well, I don't want to say I like, that is, um, uh, the Bible explained, the eschatological, like when Jesus died, when Jesus came and he died on the cross, the victory was won. So there is a part that is complete, but then there is a part that is not yet. So there is a part of the victory of Jesus on the cross where the Bible says, by his stripes you are healed, where we are not supposed to walk in sickness. It is done on the cross because on the cross of Christ, Jesus took away our sin. He took away our sicknesses. He took away our pain. He took away all of that. It is done. It is sealed. But still, it is not fully complete yet because there is a... Not yet. The one that happens in the eschatol that's when we meet Jesus face to face. The eschatological part of it. So while we are still in this in-between place, it's, let me try to give a practical example. When someone is going to act a movie, the, the movie producer knows the end of a movie. They know where it's going to end already. When I come and I sit to watch the movie, I don't have an idea of where the movie is going. The producer have the whole script written from beginning to end. And the actors 
come in between and they play their part to bring that movie to its conclusion. I am a spectator watching. When I start, there are times when I'm going to cry because of the emotions. I'm like, oh, what is going to happen? Is the actor going to die? Is this going to happen? The producer is just smiling because there is a finish. There's an end to what the movie looks like. And so when Jesus comes and dies, the deal is done. It is finished. But now we are in this in-between space where we have to live out in partnership with God what is going to fully happen when we meet at the ex-cathedral, when we meet Jesus face to face. And that's the hope of believers, that we know that this life doesn't end yet. There's a day is going to come where there is no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears. So that's the only reason why we are still in pain, because we are still living in this world that is broken. When Jesus died, he did that part, but creation is still waiting. And a lot of brokenness is still existing. A time is going to come when all of this is set and done, when there will be full restoration. So the restoration is not complete yet. So it's important that we, that we understand that. Can I get the next slide, please? So um, when I talk about um, peace flowing like a river, is that when we as believers, now that we have Jesus in our hearts, we have this peace in our hearts, the Bible prophesies, to, um, Isaiah prophesied, tells us in Isaiah, it says, for thus said the Lord Jehovah, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream and ye shall suck thereof you shall be, you shall be born, okay, I'm not going to read that part because I can't, I can't fully see, it's so tiny, I'm sorry, <laughs> and I, I put it there, so, <laughs> but what is most important is like, God is telling them, like, rivers shall flow out of, that's a prophecy to Israel, that this river, that this prince of peace that is going to come, it's not just going to be just Jesus having, Jesus being the prince of peace, but out of Jesus, rivers shall flow out of us. And I know you're like saying, okay, Pastor Verma, how do you connect the river plus the peace? The Bible says that in the book of, of, of Joel, that out of our belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. So when we have Jesus as our prince of peace in the inside of us, what should come out of us is rivers. And these rivers of living water are rivers of peace, rivers of joy, rivers of God's presence that goes out to bless the nation. And these rivers, the reason why God doesn't like, it's not like Jesus came and died and everything is finished, we are here in the eschaton, it's because God has always wanted partnership with human beings. When God created the heavens and the earth, the first thing he did was to put Adam and Eve and say, hey guys, you are in charge. Take care. And God hasn't changed. We are still partners with God. We are still partners with God. And I really like, I like it. When you have time, go and read the book of Psalms chapter 8. And read it, in, like just read it in different translations and you'll be amazed by what it says. He says, when I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, that you set in place. What is man that you have been mindful of him and the mortal that you have taken note of him? What is man that you have been mindful of him and the mortal that you have taken note of him that you have made him a little less than the divine or angels and adorned him? Oh, there should be another verse. Uh, the next verse says, like, God has made him in charge of everything, a steward of everything that God has created. God has placed us human beings in charge of everything. So as much as God is in heaven, God does not come to earth to control our day-to-day -day affairs. And that's why you still have the world. Because God does not come to lead nations. Human beings have been delegated with that authority. It's going to be wrong for God to delegate authority to us and then step in again and start bossing us on how we should do it. No. He gives us human beings the freedom to do what they want to do, how they want to do it. He's trusting that humans are going to come and say, hey, God, give me wisdom. But even if human beings don't ask God for wisdom, God doesn't step in to force his will on us. Even in our, our personal lives. God doesn't step in into our personal lives to force his will on us. I have the freedom to wake up this morning and decide, okay, I'm not going to church, I'm just going to stay home. Let the people, they want to be there and there's no pastor, that's their choice. It is my freedom, it is my will, and that's how God has chosen to work with human beings from the very beginning of time. From the very beginning, and this is the most powerful thing that we have as human beings, but it's also the most dangerous blessing that God has given us. The blessing of free will. 
The blessing to be partners with God to rule his world. The blessing to be partners with God to take care of creation. I can choose to litter the entire creation with plastic and destroy it. And then years down the road, then we have global warming and I'm the same one that complains. I can choose to do that or I can choose to be a good steward of the creation that God has given me. It is my, I won't blame God when it starts to happen. It is my choice as a human being to partner with God, to bring peace on earth, to see that his purpose is to see that his counsel come to pass. So when I say peace like a river, what, does, what is the characteristics of a river? Is that one of the things about a river is whether the river is long, it's short, it's deep, it's shallow. It has the capacity of going through like any space. There are times when some rivers are strong enough that they pave their own path. They create their own path. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but when I was reading about rivers, I saw that the Grand Canyon, like it's just so beautiful because the rivers, the volcanoes were able to just create a path that makes it incredibly amazing. But that's how powerful rivers can be, that when we allow God's spirit in the inside of us to start flowing like rivers, we can start changing the course of the world. We can start changing the course of things. We can start changing circumstances and situations. We can become God's instrument to bring healing where there is brokenness, to bring hope where there is hopelessness, to bring peace where there is strife. When we sit back and not do anything, I say, well, if I talk, there's going to be trouble. Guess what? Peace doesn't come when we are quiet. Peace comes when we rise and stand for justice, when we rise and do what God has called us to do. If the church remains silent, the world will keep going down. If the church doesn't rise up to action, the world will keep going the way it's, where, the way it's going. We are the ones with peace. We are the ones with light. And God says, can I partner with you to bring peace to the entire world? Can I partner with you to bring peace to your neighbor who is spending sleepless, sleepless nights and say, would you allow that peace to flow through you to them to bring peace to their lives and family? Can I partner with you to bring peace to that child who is struggling and being abused? Can I partner with you? We are God partners in this thing. Jesus came and he died as prince of peace and he says, now you are my instruments of peace. And he wants us to be that river that flows. And there's something that I like about, um, uh, there's this prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 1 to 12. But I'm going to read it in the book of Revelations. Because Revelation gives us an idea like this is what it's going to be like the final, final thing. And it's just so beautiful that I want to read that to you. What happens when we as sons of God and daughters of God start rising up to allowing these rivers of peace to flow? What truly happens? The Bible says, then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street to the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be a curse. So when you look at, 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 the, at this text, the prophecy is coming to the book to... to John is having this revelation about Jesus who is going to come, about Jesus and the river that is flowing from the temple. I think I'm just going to go ahead and read the one in Ezekiel because I think that's a lot more better than Revelations. The man brought me into the entrance. I want to go all the way down so I'm not going to take all of our time. Okay, from verse, verse 8. From verse 7, when I arrived there, I saw a great, then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties itself into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this river flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. 
Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Englem. There will be places of spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But when the swam, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on the banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will the fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. In Revelation, it shows, shows us that the water is coming from the throne of God, from the temple of God. And who knows that, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says when this river, when we start allowing this river to flow through us, wherever the river flows, when it's a dead sea, everything comes back to life. Everything that is dead comes back to life. Fishes start coming of every kind. And that's talking about the souls of men. People start being changed, start being transformed, start being impacted. When, this, when we let this river of peace to flow, but the leaves of the trees start becoming healing to the nations. That people who are broken, people who are bound, we start becoming like God's medicine to them. That one conversation with them changes and transforms their lives. I so strongly believe that in this season, as we celebrate Advent, there are many who are going to be in seasons of crisis, but we are God's instruments of peace. And like the songwriter say in the song, God, make me your instrument of peace. Where there is trouble, where there is darkness, where there is striving, where there is shame, where there is bondage, may I be your instrument of peace. Can you bow your heads together with me? And I want you to think and ask the Lord, God, where are you calling me to be an instrument of peace in this season? It might be first peace with yourself or maybe peace with God. It might be time for you to like say, hey, God, I need to come back. I've, I've strayed a little. I've been so busy and caught up with my own things and my own life. And it might be time to say, I need peace back with you. There are so many pieces that are broken in my life and, God, I need you to put them back together. It might be peace with a family member. Peace with a friend. Or it might be just letting this reverse flow to someone that you know is hurting and God is saying, can I use you as my instrument of peace? Can you just take a moment and talk to God? And say, God, here am I. Use me as your instrument of peace. Make me the vessel that can be a blessing to others. So that your life can flow through me to bring healing and wholeness and life and restoration where it's needed. So God, here we are, we come. We come, Father, knowing that at times we have been instruments of brokenness, instruments to increase the tension and the chaos, that we have not allowed the river of your presence to flow through us as we should. We recognize that there are times we have ignored the pain of others. We have been so content with our own peace that the pain of others haven't really mattered to us. And God, we repent of that and we say, God, here we are this morning. Make us your instruments of peace. That in this partnership with you, we will let this rivers to flow out of us so fresh so that we become a blessing and healing to all those who need it around us. Thank you. In Jesus' name.